Lord be with you. And also with you. We gather here to worship God. We gather to remember how Jesus suffered and died for us and to thank God for his love and his mercy. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. As one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you gave your Son to suffer the shame of the cross. Save us from hardness of heart, that seeing him who died for us, we may repent, confess our sin, and receive your overflowing love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel of John, beginning with chapter 18, verse 28, through chapter 19, verse 30. The crucifixion of Jesus. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate answered him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king, they cried out, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, 
Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. Then they also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the other disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
This is an awful story, the gospel account of the crucifixion of Jesus. We call this Friday good, but there was nothing good about the crucifixion. The crucifixion was a violent, torturous execution. And it was an act of betrayal, an act of fear, an act of abandonment, and the consequences that came from it. And then an account of what happened to someone treated this way by his friends and his family. The crucifixion is an example of the worst that can happen to a human in this life, and the worst that humans in this life can inflict on others. We humans should see ourselves all over this story. Where are you in this story? Are you in the crowd? Are you amongst the soldiers gambling for his garment? Are you one of the indicting priests bringing forward the prisoner to Pilate? Are you Pilate? Are you Judas outside this particular account? Are you amongst the women, the frightened at the cross, watching? Where are you in this story? Sometimes Christian thought, Christian reflection has said about this story that it was necessary that Jesus died. One of the things that is true in the gospel account though, in the gospel account of what happened, one of the things that is true is that after the death of Jesus, none of the disciples who went back to their room or their homes, none of the disciples went with the sense that something necessary had happened, nor that something good had been achieved. There was nothing apparent to them in the death of Jesus that seemed positive, at least as the Gospels report it. Instead, the crucifixion is seen through the triumph of God in the resurrection. Jesus did not die on the cross because it was necessary that someone make a restitution that had to be satisfied. God was merciful in the resurrection. God was merciful in the amazing act of God's powerful love in the resurrection because mercy is God's nature, because God is good and great, and because God chose to be merciful. The death of Jesus was a disaster, and that's the point of this story. It was all over for his followers when Jesus dies. As the disciples going to Emmaus in Luke's account said, we had hoped this was the one, but we're leaving now because clearly he wasn't. If the resurrection had not happened at the end of this gospel account, if they hadn't experienced the risen Christ, there'd be no Christianity. If Jesus' death did not issue in some new act on the part of God to bring life out of that tragedy, there's no Christianity. All through the Christian Old Testament, through the Jewish scriptures, God is revealed in the history of God's people to be the merciful redeemer of the whole world, the merciful God who loves the world, who creates the world, and creates all in the world, the God who created and loves the animals and nature around them, the God who frees the slaves, the God who walks with people in their troubles. That's the God of Scripture. In Exodus 34, when Moses, on the Mount of Sinai, receiving the law, when Moses encounters God, God reveals God's nature, saying, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann calls that text a credo of adjectives about the character of God. That phrase and those adjectives about the character of God are repeated again and again in the Psalms and also in the prophets. Jesus, as seen in the Gospel of John, is the Word made flesh. And Jesus, the God of gracious, saving mercy, had personally joined the flesh of the world and lived among us. And in Jesus, God was put to death by us. That's how this world and the people in it, the people like you and me, that's how this world treated Jesus. We crucified Jesus. 
Therefore, what we go through by way of agony and suffering is not unknown to God. God in Jesus was the recipient of that agony and suffering that we are capable of inflicting on others. God who created everything chose to join the world's suffering, undergo it, and know what it means from the inside. Pope Francis has said, whether a creature lives only a few minutes or a long life, they belong to God, and God is with them. That's the accompaniment, the presence of God with all beings in their life and their death, with the hope that there is something more. When Jesus is resurrected, it shows us the power of God's love in the tossed aside. It shows us the power of God's love for the mistreated, the power of God's love for the abused, the hopeless. In James Cone's The Cross and the Lynching Tree, he writes, faith that emerged out of the scandal of the cross is not a faith of intellectuals or elites of any sort. This is the faith of abused and scandalized people. This is the faith of the losers and the down and out. This is the faith of those who have been tortured. This is the faith of those who have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. We humans are all over this story. This is not only the worst that can happen to someone, it's the worst that we can inflict. Where are you in this story? In the crowd? Afraid with the disciples? Running away, assigned a dirty job to perform like the soldiers? This is an account of the worst that could befall someone, and it's the worst that you could do to someone. We are called to love one another, but this is the account of how all too often we actually treat one another. Fleming Rutledge writes, the liturgy of Palm Sunday that flows through Passion Week is set up to show you how we people can say one thing one minute and the opposite the next. This is the nature of sinful human beings. The same crowd that is crying out Hosanna on Palm Sunday is the crowd that's crying out crucify him on Good Friday. This is the truth about us. And looking at the crucifixion, what we see and hear in Jesus' death is not just solidarity with the victims of the world. It is that, but it is not only that. What we see and hear in the cry of dereliction is Jesus' identification in his cross with the tortures, with the frightened, with those who bring judgment, with those who betray him. What Jesus assumes on the cross is not only the suffering of the innocents, but also the wickedness of those who inflict the suffering. He is fully human. And when, as Luke remembers, he says from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, he makes himself one, not only with my pain, but also with my sin, because I myself and you, yourself, and all of us ourselves are sometimes victims of others and sometimes torturers of others and sometimes both. And when we recognize this, we are, as Jesus says to the scribes, not far from the kingdom. Sometimes, often, violence seems the horrible, consistent trajectory of the human community. Often it seems to me that violence is almost just the given trajectory of the human story. This week, as I have written this meditation, the news brings us the story of a baptized, self-identifying Christian young man who has murdered six Asian women in Atlanta and two others as a perverse act of hatred. And it tells us of an innocent one-year-old strapped in his car seat in Houston, shot in the head inadvertently by a law enforcement officer trying to protect the child's mother. Humans also often just mess up everything. We either bring forward hatred that seems straight out of the mouth of hell, or we mess up things in our good intentions. Well, I know there are good stories. I know there are good stories. I have seen them, I have witnessed them, and I have been a part of them. But our good stories do not redeem the history of our narrative. And the Good Friday story teaches us that. Here 
in the account of the crucifixion of Jesus, there is not a place for hope. Pilate, in a mockery of justice, says to the furious crowd threatening insurrection, how about we flog Jesus? Does that satisfy you? And it might have, except this crowd of humans will only settle for killing him. But Jesus never brings a any kind of violence to bear on them. He never strikes out in obliterating anger toward us. His suffering and his endurance of us, that's what we see. He is loving the people around the cross, not feeling sweet about them, but engaged in relationship with his torturers. He asks for their forgiveness. That's what's on his lips as he dies as opposed to killing them. That's what the crowd wants to do with Jesus, to kill him, crucify him, they cry. This is what it means to follow Jesus. We have to stop killing each other. When people ask me, what's the first thing that I should do in order to follow Jesus? I will answer them, well, stop killing others. And they laugh often, but it's true. Stop killing each other and stop wishing each other were dead. Ignorant hating, excluding, and killing is sometimes, it seems to me, the universal sin of the world to this day. There is no way on earth the disaster of Good Friday can be repaired. This is the broken, hopeless disaster we are left with. There is no way on earth the disaster and the story of the crucifixion of Jesus can be repaired. And that's the point of Good Friday. Every broken one of us is in this story. No matter how crummy we have been or how crummy we are or how broken we are, we're in this story. This is a disaster. Only God can fix this. That's the point of Good Friday. It's a demonstration of the breadth of our brokenness. We humans are broken. That's the point of Good Friday. There is nothing so broken that God cannot redeem it. There is nothing so flawed that it is beyond the reach of God's resurrection love. To understand the capability of God's resurrecting love, we must learn again the depth of human depravity. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. For that part of the story, we must wait now three days.
Psalm 22 is the traditional psalm reading for Good Friday and the psalm that the Gospels report Jesus quoted from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword my life from the power of the dog, save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying, that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me the prayer of confession, and then we'll share together in silent prayer. Merciful God, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen. Chapter 19 of the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 31, reading to verse 42. The 
burial of Jesus. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe it. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Solemn Reproaches of the Cross is an ancient text of Western Christendom associated with Good Friday. It comes at the conclusion of the service. The reproaches follow the pattern of Psalm 78, which rehearses God's continuing acts of faithfulness and Israel's repeated rebellion. Each of the reproaches follows a similar pattern, calling to mind God's saving acts and concluding with the same words. Following each reproach, the congregation responds with a prayer for mercy. Traditionally, the reproaches conclude the Good Friday service. O my people, O my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, Holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. My peace I gave which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. Would you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom? I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Christ, have mercy. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Christ, have mercy. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior.